Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to another exciting episode. Joining me is Michael Korn from The Washington Post. Michael is a climate journalist who has the Climate Coach advice column in The Post. I love talking to reporters. Always fascinating to see how the media approaches the issue of climate change. We go behind the scenes and learn how a national newspaper like The Post covers climate change. They have really beefed up their coverage in the last couple of years and we'll learn how they've structured that coverage. We discuss some of the diverse topics he covers in his Climate Coach column and his increasing focus on climate adaptation. Other topics Michael and I dig into? Should the Post play a role in creating awareness around the emerging adaptation sector? Should climate skepticism be a bigger story? And how Michael brings the latest climate science into his articles. We cover a ton of ground, and we'll also hear a bit about Michael's experiences editing a newspaper in Cambodia. We're going to start the episode off with a short interview with Laura Hesse Fisher from MIT and hear about the new season of their Today I Learned Climate podcast. I hope you enjoy. This was a fun episode to record. But before we get started, I wanted to encourage my listeners to reach out. I usually save this for the end of the episode, but this is really important information for the podcast. As the host of American Apps, I'm always eager to connect with my listeners and hear their feedback on the show, whether you want to share your thoughts or suggest a guest you'd like to hear from. I'm open to it all. What's also critically important is hearing what you guys do and how the podcast is a resource to your careers. This information is incredibly important to me. Please take the time and reach out. I can be reached at americadapts at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you. All right, let's get this episode started. Hey, Adapters, we're back, and I'm with Laura Hesse Fisher, and she is the program director with MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative, and she's also the host with Today I Learn Climate Podcast. Hey, Laura, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Doug. It's great to be back. So you're coming on. We're having this short interview, and it's kind of an exciting time. You guys have a new season, right? Yes, we do. Fifth season coming out fifth season. I remember when you guys first started. Well, let's ground people first, though. Let's just talk about what do you guys do there at the initiative? Let's let us know that. And then tell us a little bit about some previous seasons so people can go back in the archive. Yeah. So what we do at the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative is we mobilize the MIT community around solving environmental challenges. And one environmental challenge is what people know and how they think about climate change and environmental challenges. So I run our communications and engagement work with a focus on the public. So TIL Climate, Today I Learned Climate, is MIT's climate change podcast. And the show helps you get smart quick on climate change, both climate change science and solutions. And we speak directly with experts from MIT and beyond. So let's talk about that archive, though. So people want to go back into that. And I just want to say you guys have a great model. They're relatively short episodes, 15 to 30 minutes, and they're substantive, but they're also relatively quick. But what do you have back there in that archive? Oh, man, we have a ton. So we have a whole season focused on energy. So if folks are interested in how wind and solar actually works, how fusion works, even what we're talking about when we say fossil fuels, We have an episode on hydrogen. And you're right. All of our episodes are 15 minutes or less. Some of them are only 10 minutes long. I got that wrong. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's it's great, though. We try and keep them really short. In fact, uh, we work really hard to keep them very short because we're really focused on our audience as the climate curious. So people who are newly interested in climate change or a particular part of climate change and maybe are not interested in, in doing a super deep dive, but just interested in clarifying what they know or learning newly something about climate change. So that's why we have a wide range of episodes. We have one on climate impacts that builds upon some of what you focus on in America Adapts, how climate change affects what you eat. We have one on hydrogen. Oh, sorry, I mentioned hydrogen already. Um, I just really like that episode, which is why I mentioned it twice. And probably my favorite one is one we did on can't we just plant a lot of trees to deal with the climate change issue? That's the one I usually recommend people start with first because I just really like it. So the model too is I think that's important because you kind of ground people when you when you start off the episodes, but then you're doing these interviews and you have quite the bench there at MIT for expertise to come on and, and share these stories, right? Yeah, I mean, it is pretty great. We spend a lot of time editing our episodes because we talk with some really smart people who know things really well And sometimes it's hard to get people to not speak from what they already know and jargon. And we really try to be the bridge between these super smart people and people, our listeners, who are really smart, but they just 
don't know a lot about climate change, or maybe they don't even know a lot about science in general. That's all okay with us. We just walk it through together in a way that's fun. So before you give us a preview of season five, and I think the first episode is out, tell us a little bit because you've been out there long enough. Who's using the podcast? I imagine schools, there's all sorts that are probably getting value of what you're doing here. Yeah, we've heard a bunch from companies that are actually educating their employees on climate change using our podcast because our episodes are short and jargon free and we don't have a political bent in our podcast episode. I think that makes it really appealing. And then also we have educator guides for each of our episodes And we're right now developing case studies with the teachers that have actually used those educator guides and the podcast to teach in the classroom. So it's really exciting to see all the different ways that the podcast is really being used out there. So season five, what's in store? Yes. Okay. So I'm excited about season five. So I'm going to, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I think that our greenhouse gases episode is the best explanation of what's actually happening with greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that's out there. Oh, boy. And the reason why, yes, I I mean, I'm going to be bold (laughs) and I'm going to say that if someone finds a better one, feel free to reach out to me. But let me tell you, we did our research, right? We looked at how people were talking about climate change and how about greenhouse gases and how they interact with the atmosphere. And we were so careful about how do we describe this and what do we keep in and what do we leave out and what metaphors work and what metaphors don't work. And we thought if there was going to be one place for someone to really understand this, we wanted to be that place. So we worked super hard on that and I'm really happy with the result. That one already came out, as you mentioned. And then the ones that are coming up, we have a really fun one about what the two biggest hurdles are to getting all of our energy from wind and solar and how do we overcome those. We have an episode on desalination, so why can't we just get all of our water from the ocean? A lot of people are talking about methane these days, and so we have an episode on on why that is and the opportunity to make a big difference on climate change in the next five to ten years by tackling methane. We have an episode on why states are building, or we have an episode that covers why states are building wind farms in the ocean when building them on land is so much cheaper and things like that. we got a good and wide variety of episodes coming up. All right. So are these episodes coming out weekly, every two weeks? How does that work? Yep. They're coming out weekly. We've never done that before. Oh, exciting. We've been working hard and that's what we're doing. So people don't have to wait like they usually have had to in the past. So weekly between now and Thanksgiving. Okay. I'm going to put you on the spot and you might not even have specific episode ideas, but season six, you must be thinking a little bit about that. We are thinking about that. So we have not committed to anything specifically yet, but we get a lot of follow-up questions. So we also run the site climate.mit.edu. And on that website, we have an Ask MIT Climate feature program where people can write to us and ask their questions about climate change. Some of the questions that we get are super technical. Some of them are super simple and everything in between. And we work with experts at MIT to answer those. An MIT person, sometimes it's beyond MIT as well, working with a science communicator. And we answer those in, you know, you can read it in one page, basically. So we're looking at pulling some of those questions for our next season. So you can check out our Ask MIT Climate series and you'll get a sense of what's to come. And also... Doug, you or any of your listeners who are interested in us answering one of their own questions, feel free to go on there and submit some. Most people know where to go, but if you give people advice to find your podcast, what would you recommend? Yeah. So it's called Today I Learned Climate. The best way to find it is to go wherever you get your podcasts and search T-I-L Climate. And you also can find our podcast at climate.mit.edu. Excellent. Laura, I'm very excited for you guys. Season five, you guys are kicking butt and you guys sound like you're here to stay. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much, Doug, and thank you for your support. Hey, Adapters, welcome back to another exciting episode. Joining me is Michael Corden. Michael is a journalist writing for the Climate Coach Advice column for the Washington Post. Before joining the Post in 2022, he spent nearly two decades as a reporter and editor covering climate, technology, and economics for outlets such as Quartz and CNN.com. And this is very interesting and serving as managing editor at Cambodia's and I'm going to mispronounce it because I've never had to say it, Phnom Penh Post. Post. (laughs) Is that right? All right. Hi, Michael. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, my first person from the Washington Post, I've had Bloomberg, Christopher Flavel, obviously doing a lot of great work at New York Times. Thanks for coming on. But let's just start off with what does it mean to be a climate coach at the Washington Post? (laughs) It's a work in progress. But basically what I'm trying to do is cover the climate from the perspective 
of how people, how individuals can engage with systematic change on climate. So it's certainly about what you can do, but it's just as much about some of the hard numbers and a rigorous analysis of what that means in the bigger picture. All right. I want to come back to the the column, obviously, but let's stay with your background, though. You've been doing this for a while. And yeah, just tell me a bit about your journey and your ending up at the Washington Post, which is obviously a high profile gig there. But you've done some interesting things. You want to just give us some highlights? Sure. So, you know, as a kid, I always used to love science. I used to love journalism. And so I was on parallel tracks for a long time and obviously ended up (laughs) here on the journalism side. But I've really gone back and forth over the course of my career. Early on, I was doing environmental coverage, but ended up in Cambodia, as you mentioned, covering the, for, for the Penampin Post and everything else. And then when I went back to the States, you know, I'd done some things and kind of thought I understood a lot of what I was doing, but I started a, a climate change special for CNN.com. And at the time, they were, I would say, uninterested is an understatement. <laughs> so I pushed ahead and I wrangled a bunch of people who spent some of their free time putting this together. And it was the the network's first special report on climate and did quite well. And I also realized as I was checking out books in the library that I didn't understand. I didn't understand the topic. I didn't understand the science, not nearly to the extent I needed to. So I ended up and went back to grad school. I went to the Yale School of Forestry and studied environmental economics. I actually worked in that field for a while. So looking at forest carbon and carbon markets. Then I actually started my own startup for a while. So I figured out how that works, raised venture capital, and then went back into journalism and really covered tech and economics and then went back into climate specifically. So I really draw on that all, every day in terms of how I use that, that in, those insights to inform my coverage. Okay, so I, I'm not sure the dynamic, but did was there a position open at the Washington Post? Did they recruit you? And they obviously were looking to do something a little bit different with your column, right? Let's see. I was on my paternity leave, so it was my last few weeks, and I was trying to figure out what to do next. And I had started a year or two earlier a newsletter called Hot House, and that sprung from my frustration with a lot of climate coverage that sort of left the reader, if not in despair, sort of at odds end. There really was not a lot of options for them to take a next step. And so they were quite frustrated, as was I. So that's how I started exploring this idea of how individuals sort of engage on systematic change with climate and did that with my, my newsletter. And then I happened to see a column, a request for columnists for a new column that they were going to create at the Washington Post. And they hadn't called it Climate Coach yet, but it wasn't in the mix once I started interviewing with them. And it turns out we were thinking along similar lines. So it worked out quite well. So I obviously will have links. I have a page for all these episodes, but I want to get to the column now and just bear with me because I want to read some of the titles from the column because I think that's part of the appeal too. That's it's it's, it's, people want to dive in and I'm just going to read a few here so people can get a flavor. Okay. What I learned when I tried installing a wind turbine on my house, (laughs) why we all need to think like Floridians now. Is it cheaper to refuel your EV battery or gas tank? We did the math in all 50 states. And why you should buy everything used. And so obviously, just a huge diversity of topics. Give us some background on how you arrive at these. (laughs) I have a, a long list accumulated over many years of questions that I've always wanted to answer or problems that I had or things that pissed me off. And based on those, I usually have a pretty rich you know, basis to find a lot of stories. So a lot of those have come from that. They've also come from readers. People write me all the time with questions or comments, and I use those. So the main idea is it really needs to have some personal connection in your life. So I don't do a lot of very high level policy or kind of, you know, scientific breakthroughs, except to the extent that it does intersect with you. So what columns seem to be doing well? Because you've got enough of them out there now. Do you feel like people more on maybe just the energy side or what do you find that's really popping with folks? Definitely not. Not not just energy or any one thing. I would say the there's no formula yet, yet but okay. what does seem to resonate consistently is electric vehicles. That has been a, a big hit. I think things that talk about our place in nature, our appreciation or how we can be, be present in nature has done well. So I wrote one about four apps that help you identify every flower, plant, and tree. I also wrote a column that was really a personal essay about why you should tell your children about fireflies because it relates to something called shifting baselines, which is the idea that every generation loses the previous baseline of what a healthy environment looks like and how to combat that. 
Yeah, we have, haven't had too many that have really bombed. I would say there's what about sustainable aviation fuels that just didn't go anywhere, but other than that. Yeah, <laughs> the demographic for that must be quite small. But I guess so. Um, so I do adaptation, obviously, with my podcast. It's an area I want to focus on, and it's what I want to talk about with you. And so there's one story in particular, and I'm curious about the background for it, is that one I already mentioned, why we all need to think like Floridians now. I'm originally from Florida. I grew up there, and obviously, I covered a lot in the podcast. I'm very frustrated by Florida. Did you actually go on location for that? And tell me a bit of history about that story. Yeah, I was on location for about 18 years. I grew up there, so uh, oh, all right. okay. I have some experience. And I've obviously been back quite a bit since then. Where that came from, I think, was you know reading about the insurance woes in the state and obviously these like, succession of natural disasters and the continual flooding that's happening, especially in South Florida. And when you, and the, the, the state's in denial at the, at the state level, at least, about what is happening and what can be done. When I looked at the projections over the next 100 years or even the next 30 to 50, it became very clear that it's not that Florida is an outlier, it's just early. And so I really wanted to kind of explore that idea. I don't know if you saw it. the New York Times, insurance and climate change has just been everywhere. It's been fascinating. They did a, a column, I think in the last week, and talking about Hurricane Ian that came through Fort Myers last year. And just what happens afterwards is that the only people who can rebuild are rich people. And part of the reasons why is all the, the codes have changed. And so you think Florida is doing a responsible thing by upgrading the codes, but it makes it more expensive. And hurricanes just become these gentrifying events. Mm -hmm. And in the short term, the government loves it because it's like, oh, tax rates on higher end property. And it's just this vicious cycle. I don't know if you got a chance to see that or, or kind of hearing that message. Yeah. And I'm not surprised. I mean, it's, it's a mess. <laughs> I mean, I think it comes down to this idea that are we going to publicly subsidize places that are not insurable and that we can sort of paper that over right now. And there are places that it will go on for a few more years or decades. But ultimately, as someone at the University of Miami told me, you can't stop the water because Florida essentially is built on, a, on limestone and sand yeah. and the water comes from underneath. And so you're right. Like these things seem, oh, they, you know, that works for the government in the short term, but it's really just borrowing from the future. Yeah, they're in denial about long-term retreat from the area. Okay, so that was a story I was very interested in because it, you know, it dealt with adaptation. I think there's some managed retreat discussion in there. Do you approach some of your columns specifically? I'm assuming just this whole field of adaptation, which I'm going to come back to later in this conversation. But is that something you're going to focus more on, or is it still the kind of the random nature of how you get ideas? <laughs> I'm going to focus more on it. I do try to think about it quite a bit. I mean, I think particularly for lower income homes, communities, that you cannot have climate policy without equity component built into it. And you're seeing that more and more. For example, in, in Oakland, they're building something called an eco block, which is not just, oh, we should get solar for these apartment buildings, is we're going to build out a microgrid with EV charging and lower solar rates and affordable housing. And so that's all built into the same system. And you're also protecting against these heat islands in urban areas that dis disproportionately affect these communities. So I'm looking more and more into that. In fact, I'm probably going to do a series on real estate next year that will kind of dive into this more deeply. But as is the nature, I think, of the topic, it requires a lot of research and kind of deep understanding. So this year has been about sort of exploring different topics and getting a feel for them. And then next year, doubling down on a few. Excellent. like to see more of that. All right. I want to pivot a little bit here. And I want to talk about the climate coverage overall at the Washington Post, because I'm fascinated by this. And I think a lot of people are fascinated and they're excited because some of the bigger shops like the Washington Post, New York Times. And just in this last week, I saw the LA Times is like they've That's announced right. increase. I want to, I'll, I'll bring that up in a little bit, but I, I want to know the sausage making there because it's <laughs> the decisions that you have to make. And maybe you're not privy to all these conversations, but I've got you, you do climate work there. And I, I do want to just read a few things here too, because I, you know, I pulled an interview with Zachary Goldfarb and they were interviewed about the climate coverage and they kind of broke down what you guys are going to do in these certain areas. And I, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. And so the first one was like politics, policy, and power team. You, so you're creating these teams covering global negotiations. And so the second one was a science and impact team that follows the leading edge of scientific developments and the evolving effects of climate change. The third team is visual storytelling team, which sounds very interesting. And then there's the extreme weather team and a climate solutions and an innovations team. So there's this notion of teams. And I think 
at the time of the writing, there were 30 reporters or people working on climate at the Washington Post. I don't know if it's gone up or down, but is that accurate? Does that still seem like what you guys are doing? Absolutely. I think the Washington Post, and Zach articulated it very well, that they've decided to carve this out as a signature area of coverage that we do better than anyone and invest the resources accordingly. And I think that I've only been obviously post for a little while, but from what I've seen, it is by far one of the most, the, 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 some of producing some of the best coverage that no one else is doing and trying to tackle these stories in ways that I think get a much larger audience than maybe a traditional sort of straight climate story does. We have our own uh, visual storytelling team, which, which he mentioned. And so those pods or those teams all kind of focus on their areas, but we also work together. So I'm constantly speaking with everyone else on various stories. And the idea, I think, ultimately is to make climate coverage at the Washington Post as compelling and maybe high profile as maybe even it's politics one day. But it's certainly been an area that I think has started that trend. Like we are we are getting more readers and audience for climate stories than than most other topics. So it's been a good sign. Well, it would have been fascinating. I'm, I'm guessing there was probably some internal strategic planning meeting that the Washington Post had because, you know, in some ways it's arbitrary. Obviously, they're covering a lot of these important points. And then when I, I've in previous life, did a lot of policy. When you look at climate change, a lot of times it's broken down even simply into mitigation, you know, the carbon <laughs> emission side, and then it's adaptation and like impacts and all those things kind of coming underneath those things. And how you guys landed on this, it's fascinating. And I just, <laughs> I, I don't, you guys haven't done it long enough and you've been doing environmental coverage for a long time, but you know how it is. Sometimes the newspapers say they're gearing up this coverage, but there just might not be interest. Do you think times have truly changed that this is a long term commitment? You know, I think it's interesting this summer was an eye-opener for the newsroom and as probably for everybody, which was this succession of disasters week after week after week. And obviously, they aren't all entirely attributed to climate, but they're all touched, even driven by it. And far from being an anomaly, we think this is the new normal. And we're reorganizing the newsroom in some ways around it in terms of travel schedules and how we attack these prop- these stories. And, you know, I can't speak for the Post. I've only been there for a little while. I know more about sort of my piece of it. But I would say that the climate story touches everyone and everything in some way. And that's only becoming more and more evident as time goes on. So I think when we think about how to cover these stories, whether it's insurance or whether it's supply chains, or whether it's cost of living, there frequently is a major component that is related to, I guess you could say climate, but really the energy transition and how we build a society that is not as dependent on fossil fuels and restores an ecosystem that is capable of supporting both the natural world and you know a healthy society. And I just don't think you can kind of silo that story personally. And I think the Post has also made that commitment. Well, listen, you obviously have the top journalists working in places like the Washington Post, but it's still a struggle. When I see some of those stories, I just think, all right, you guys are doing a story on wildfire or extreme heat. And then they're you guys throw in most of the time, which is good. I think that's been a like evolution of coverage has been great. Like climate change comes into it, but that kind of creates its own problems too. You're like, okay, extreme heat is much worse because of climate change and that it becomes less reporting on the event. Let's say about some heat wave somewhere, then you're getting into kind of speculation on what climate change might mean for this in the future. Mm -hmm. And that to me, I'm like, man, you're probably losing people right there. Even though you're being Hmm. responsible by linking it there, it's just like you're speculating on like what climate change will mean to something. It must be a challenge to try to report news in real time and yet bring in those bigger topics. And then to throw on top of that, and on top of that, this is only going to get worse if we don't stop consuming fossil fuels, which in some ways is unrelated to the original, like we're reporting on this. I hope that makes sense. It's just, it's, it can get so messy so quickly <laughs> trying to link, right. oh, and by 2050, by 2075, again, you're losing people because they're like, what, huh? And so- Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, are we losing people? I don't know. And it definitely does get into this sort of, somewhat still disputed sort of attribution science of it all, right? Right, um, right. And that's getting tighter, though. It's getting tighter. It's just it's more of like that story that you've created with that one article. And then all of a sudden, you're bringing in characters that 
aren't necessarily a good fit for that article. And I, again, you're being responsible by like, trying to tie it into climate change. Mm-hmm. But I just find when I read this, I'm like, oh, boy, I that see. just you, it's it's sort of taken a turn that might make the message less compelling. So interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I don't cover that as much day to day, but that certainly could be something that we look at. I, I think we, you know, we look at our stories every year and try to evaluate sort of what's really serving the reader. What are they asking for? Is this helpful? Is this clarifying? And it, it may very well be that, you know, trying to tie every one of those stories to climate change is, is not always that useful, but I think people definitely want to know if this happened, is this a precursor for what we're going to see next or not? Right. And then obviously when it gets political and (laughs) someone will say it just like, oh, there was a big rain event and they're tying it to climate change. Well, listen, basically every weather event on the planet today is related to climate change because we have this new (laughs) Earth's atmosphere. But like you said, attribution, it's like it gets less confident, but then they bang you on the head for it because you're using it. Anyway, I feel sorry for you guys because it's you're trying to teach those bigger lessons, but it's difficult as you weave into its own sort of individual story. So That's true. Listen, I want to talk about adaptation. And some of this, not even necessarily representing the Washington Post, but by all means, is, but what's your sense of adaptation? You've written about it, but what do you think it really is? What is climate adaptation? <laughs> I'm getting more and more interested in this as time goes on because it's becoming very clear that we will have to do this sooner than we thought. And we're devoting more resources to covering this in places like Louisiana and Texas, the Gulf Coast, the Outer Banks, because sea level rise is not happening the same in every place and it's happening faster than we predicted in some cases. In terms of adaptation, what does that mean? I mean, it, it, I think it means creating a society that understands, you know, past is not going to be a guarantee of any future that we know of, and that we're going to see greater extreme conditions, more volatility, and the sort of status quo was designed or evolved in, a, in a conditions that will not be true in 10 years or five or, or 20. You know, I, that was a very high level understanding, but that's how I understand it. I would love to get your thoughts. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to ask. I've got a reporter on who covers these things. So I've been doing adaptation until I started the podcast. I was doing adaptation policy. And what I don't sense from most of the media is like adaptation is its own sector. It's, and it's trying to establish its own identity. So you, I mean, we refer to the energy sector all the time, right? Mm-hmm. You know, like someone's got the energy sector beat. People don't look at adapt. They might talk about sea level rise and what's going to happen on the coast of Florida. And we might have to adapt, but there are, adaptation societies that are, are emerging. There's people that consider themselves adaptation professionals. And I don't know if you followed it. I, I should be, I was going to ask you potentially about delaying this, but right now the White House is doing this national resilience framework announcement. It's like a three hour thing. They've got all these people and I'll watch it on YouTube later, but it's this big emerging area. And when I just don't sense the, the media looks at the adaptation sector as its own emerging sector, its own identity. And I, personally, and that's what I'm sort of advocating to you is it deserves it because there's people who have dedicated their planners and all these things, people going to school now focusing on adaptation. And I just don't think a lot of people in the media realize this. I think that's generally probably true. I mean, I, I interviewed Beth Gibbons, who was executive director oh, right. of the okay, right, right, Beth, Society of yeah. Adaptation Professionals. And so uh, that was my first introduction to this idea of what she calls communities of practice. These are people who are kind of coalescing around solutions to fight climate change. But I also think that she, even if she said it was so early that the, this wasn't like a well-defined sector and, and we have a long way to go. And so I think of it a little bit like startups and, you know, pets.com era where you just sort of could see this new industry forming, but it was very ad hoc. And, and so I have no doubt that in a couple of years, we would have a very different conversation on that. But I think it's still early days. Well, I like to consider my podcast a community of it too. I've been doing this seven years. I'm the only one still doing just solely ad- adaptation podcast. And so the, what's nice, I hear from people out there. And now a lot more people from the private sector have been kind of coming out and telling me that they listen to the podcast. A lot of government people, but people that consider themselves adaptation professionals and doing adaptation policy. And so I'm an advocate for it. It deserves its own identity. And right now it's just like, well, we're going to, society is going to adapt to these impacts and it doesn't quite get where that energy sector. And I think everyone would benefit if they understood there are people on the job focusing on this. It is a thing. So 
Do you consider the chief heat officers of cities those types of positions or those adaptations? That's an adaptation professional, yeah. And I, I know some of them and yeah. It might get to a, it might actually get to a point where they just become so integrated in all s- parts of sector. You don't necessarily that's happening right now. And you talk to Beth and it's like, all right, should it, they, it be its own thing? Or is it just so embedded with like urban planning schools and all that, that they're just doing adaptation and there's different camps that are like, well, the benefit of we're like, okay. Cause there's, I recommend there's a national adaptation form that happens every two years. I don't know if that's on your radar. Next one's in St. Paul, Minnesota and, and I think April. And then there was just a California adaptation form and they're the biggest, you know, when it comes to adaptation, California is the big one. That was in uh, just in LA area just last month that I went to. So just a lot of cool stuff happening there and people focused on it. So. Right. I mean, I think, I think behind the scenes, you'll see these adaptation professionals sort of congregate around, you know, their, their skills or these new disciplines. I think from a public facing point of view, perhaps similar to data science and, and some other fields, it just becomes part of an organization that is integrated into almost every level. And that may in some ways be a better outcome. Yeah, I'm on the fence, but I use my podcast. If you look through my archive and just the amount of people working on it, it's, it's pretty amazing. And I've, it's been a learning experience for me too. I was mainly in the conservation sector and it's just like, wow, everyone else in these other sectors are kind of doing national security <laughs> and all these things. So <laughs> it's encouraging. All right. I want to pivot a little bit again here. And just, is there someone who does like the resilient speed at Washington Post or is it just sort of embedded within all that other coverage I've mentioned earlier? So I would say no one has a job title with, with resilience or adaptation built into it. I would say that we have a team that's working on how, like, like basically, I think almost everyone from different teams teams at some point has gone to different communities or talked to sort of policymakers or local governments and tried to understand what is the problem you're facing? What are, what steps are you taking to confront that? And how does that sort of match the scale of the challenge? And so I don't think it's its own siloed thing. It really does touch several of the different teams. All right. I got a few questions from I, to, to ask people for them. And one just gave me even that in ass. I do you use the term natural disaster in your columns? I'm sure I have. I don't think about it one way or another, but I can't say I have, but I have used it in the past. And it's there all the time. I've had on several times and I'm just friends with uh, Anita Van Breda from World Wildlife Fund. And she's like their disaster management director there at World Wildlife Fund. And so she just has this issue when the media uses natural disasters. And obviously, you know, where I'm kind of going with this is that there's nothing natural about these things. And when politicians say it's an act of God. It's like, no, it's act of a lot of bad planning. And <laughs> yeah, so obviously you haven't thought about it too much, but now that I'm putting you on the spot, do you think there's value in not using natural disasters? It's a great question. So I have thought about the idea of the nature of a disaster. The terminology natural, I haven't objected to in the sense that the, you know, when we talk, when in common conversation, when we talk about a hurricane or an earthquake, there is an element outside of human control to that, obviously. The effects of those obvi- are completely dependent or much very dependent on what we have done as a society and as individuals to prepare for that. You know, I think back to Bangladesh and, you know, the disasters that have happened there were far, far more lethal in the 1970s than they are more recently, despite changes in population and vulnerability. So I think it's, you raise a good point. Like, should we really refer to them as natural disasters? I think we would do a disservice if we only called them that and didn't speak directly to the fact that the, the consequences of a natural disaster or of a disaster generally is directly proportional to, to how we respond to them or prepare for them. That's how I think about it. It's kind of this debate that people have in the space. And a lot of times people just think, I mean, Anita in this case, and I agree to a certain extent, is just you're projecting onto the the natural aspect of this. When a hurricane hits Miami and because of a lot of bad planning decisions, and remember the recent hurricane that just came through the panhandle of Florida, minimal damage because it hit probably the, you know, Florida, the only spot that's really not populated in Florida. So it was almost lucky. And I mean, I, of course, there was some severe damage there, but compared to hitting Tampa, they were lucked out in some sense. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, I lived through at least nearby Hurricane Andrew down in Miami, and I remember the devastation going down there. And since then, they've changed the codes and and changed a lot about how Florida builds and develops. And, you know, there's goods and bads with that. But it it is a very different sort of built infrastructure situation than it was then. I want to go back to you. You'd mentioned the idea of attribution science and such. And 
how do you as a reporter, because you, you can't let trying to get the perfect information paralyze you from doing things. But like when you talk about climate science, is there a process that you go through that when you're doing, of course, most of your stories are science related. Do you feel like you have a, like a Rolodex of climate scientists <laughs> that you check in? And that just shows my age when I say Rolodex. But what is that? Tell us a bit about that process. Sure. Yeah. You know, I've been this for a long time, as you said. And so I actually have a pretty well-developed Rolodex or I have a, a, a software system where I collected, let's see, I think upwards of 3,000 sources wow. that, I've, that I've tagged for various topics. And they may come from the you know, research and universities, they may come from industry, they may come from elsewhere, from practitioners. And so I generally, before I start any column, I will do quite a bit of research. I'll look through my old clips, I'll look through the post clips, I'll look through online, I'll look through books on the topic, I'll find sources in my contact list, and I'll set up a, a research page and I'll state, you know, kind of what I know and what my questions are. And I pretty quickly, because I'm, you know, my, my training is I have a master's in environmental science. So I, I understand a lot of the scientific mm -hmm. literature and I can read up on it pretty quickly. And then I can go in with very targeted questions to get up to speed on a particular topic. Usually I'll already have an understanding or a basic understanding of, of it. But occasionally, like I'm working on community solar right now, and it turns out that is a far, far more complicated subject than I ever imagined. Hmm. And so I'm taking an extra week to probably get my mind around it. So it just depends. How often do they come out? I feel like it's a couple times a week, but that's not the way it's a little less often than that. <laughs> I have what a weekly it? column plus two newsletters, and one of those newsletters is like a short version of the column. So it's a, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm really, you're busy. I'm oh, busy. busy. Well, you mentioned the newsletter, and so I, I get that. It's the Climate 202. That's the main newsletter for the climate team, right? Climate 202 is its own separate thing, but it is on the climate team, and they're primarily covering policy. Then I have a Climate Coach newsletter, which is really focused on the column, plus a news roundup from you know across the world. Okay, you're going to love this bit of advice, but I get that. And she, she the woman who, who runs that, she has a section like external stories that aren't Washington Post. Yes. And they never put in podcasts there. And there's actually a lot of great climate podcasts. And I, it doesn't even have to be America Adapts, but there's just yeah. occasionally a nod to a climate podcast putting out some good content. And it's never in there. So just if you next staff meeting, if you could be like, hey, I'll raise about it. it. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Okay. You're going to love answering this question. And I do this when I, when I talk to policy people, uh, when I do these long interviews on the podcast, and shouldn't climate skepticism be a bigger story that the media covers? I mean, we're not 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where newspapers would have like pro and con. We're yeah. past that. You guys are on board. The science is good. And yet we have really powerful people that aren't just a little bit, they're outright skeptics. Shouldn't that be a bigger story? Good question. Well, you know, Yale does this awesome survey over the last 10 years, I think now, even longer. And they basically look at, you know, what is the percentage of the U.S. population that is, like their attitudes towards climate. And at this point, only about 11% are really dismissive. So they're saying, you know, it's a hoax or what have you. And then another 11% have some doubts. But we're now up to the point where over I think, 60 or 70% are somewhere between alarmed and sort of cautious. And so I think, I don't know if we're really at a point where a big societal debate is happening about is climate change real or, you know, skeptical about the fact that it might not be, you know, somewhat it'd be attributed to humans. That is a narrative that exists out there and there are people talking about it. But at least from that perspective, I don't, I'm not sure that that's been a huge huge conversation. Certainly there are people, politicians or, or other folks who have a particular point of view and are very vocal about it. But I don't know if we, do you mean to cover it from the perspective of the arguments or just the fact that it exists? Oh, not the arguments. No, don't yeah. waste your time on that. Now, and listen, I'm going to push back and disagree. I know the Yale stuff. I've followed that for years. And to me, some of the questions there, it's almost like push polling. Like you're right. You're asking people and they're like, well, okay, it sounds right. And like, Listen, we, we we know what we're talking about here. Just one party is really in denial about these things. And if all these people truly thought that this was an issue, it would reflect into the people that they elect. And if you looked at the National Republican Party, tons of skeptics and then yeah. a lot of the higher leaders there. This is people making policy decisions. And like you the debate was the other night and the way they talk about climate change now is something that was like 2007. And <laughs> it, it, I, I disagree with you. That is like all the American public's come up. 
in the very sort of like, I don't care about this issue, but sure, I believe in climate change. I think that what might be going on, but when it comes to, and when we have people in charge of policy who are outright skeptics, because look, yeah. everyone knows if Trump or whoever, someone similar to him becomes president in 2025, they're going to pull out of the Paris Accords. And those are very consequential things because they're skeptics. And so yeah. I guess I could disagree that we're, we've already kind of turned that no, we have not. I guess you're right there to make a distinction between people who think it's happening and people who are willing to make changes, either personal or policy oriented because of it. And in that sense, the latter, certainly there's a huge partisan divide there. And that's undeniable that at the top of the party, you're, you're seeing that as well. There's a lot of coverage of it. I, again, this is not my particular specialty. Okay, right. And so I just can have an opinion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I, I think we can talk about it and we can point out maybe logical inconsistencies or the fact that it's not, you know, that climate policies are supported by much of the country. I don't know if that is the driving force in swaying uh, politicians one way or another. You know, our job is really to look yeah. at this and say, like, what's happening? Why is it happening? And try to inform peace of people as, as, as well as possible. I do think there's a bit of eye rolling and then part of it's just normalized because they, they they do say really extreme things about it's not happening. And I think it, we're at the stage we're so tired of that. We just kind of like roll our eyes without really recognizing, I guess, some of the things that Trump might say is that, oh, well, that's outrageous. But we've heard 500 things like that. And so anyway, I think climate covered suffers because of that. But that's my opinion. Yeah, that's very possible. <laughs> I want to go back to the you guys cover climate change, the Washington Post. And I said earlier, the L.A. Times just is they ramped up the coverage, they announced it. Any just sort of early thoughts on that? Have you poked around on what they're going to do and stuff? Any uh, thoughts on like um, maybe how it's different than Washington Post? I just saw this a few days ago. I just congratulated a few people and I'm excited to read it. I know that they started with some coverage of dams and there's actually trade-offs because you know, you're taking down dams, which is great for the ecosystem on the coastal California, but you're also reducing some of those renewable energy resources. And so it's interesting to me. I, it was a great, I think, good piece that kind of examined the trade-offs that we're going to have to make as we transition to cleaner energy. And it's not free, right? There's always some costs. So, but I'm really excited to read what they produce. Yeah, in California, obviously, there's <laughs> ground zero for, I mean, that's where you live right now, right? You're based in California. That's right. I'm talking yeah, to you from San Francisco. It's just so much climate stuff. When I was at that forum, it's just like light years ahead of other parts <laughs> of the country. So and yeah. for better, for worse, right? I'm sure there's locals there, like we're not doing enough, but it's still pretty impressive. This is, a, again, a big pivot, but I'm just fascinated. You are managing editor at a newspaper in Cambodia. Can you just give us a flavor of what that meant and what kind of stories you were doing? Yes. I showed up to Phnom Penh as a fresh graduate from undergrad, and I had no idea what I was doing. I had studied a little bit of the language, so Khmer, and my, my goal at going to Cambodia was that it had a free press and, I should say chaos, but free press, and it was had an environment that was really under siege and worth saving. And so I was something I really wanted to cover. So from logging to politics, and it turns out uh, almost all my coverage on one way or another kind of related back to corruption, which was the driving force behind a lot of the decisions being made. But I really cut my teeth there, you know, as, as a journalist, and then eventually as the managing editor, and ran the newsroom of 15 people, half expats and, and half Khmer, Cambodian and learned a, a hell of a lot. And it was a very scrappy place that did great work. And I think really, to the extent possible, hold the government to accounts and was able to give the, a voice to a lot of people who didn't have one. What a unique experience, huh? That, that must yeah. have been fascinating. I loved it. I loved it. I miss it. Although it was a little very interesting. You know, you'd get the, the head of one of the political parties come into your office and make threats. And it was a, a very small town, but very exciting. This is how my mind works. Like if I had to do it, Cambodia, Vietnam, or Thai, I'm thinking what's better food? And I'm Thai and Vietnamese <laughs> food is just a bit better than Cambodian food. But that that's how my mind works. So yeah, once you live there, you'll you'll discover the the greatness. Okay, okay, good good to know. What's next for you? What sort of stories can you share? Or maybe you talked a little bit about some of the topics you want to do maybe next year and such. But just give us uh, maybe a primer on what's coming up next? Sure. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm probably going to work on a series around real estate and where we live in some form or another. And 
Uh, that's a combination, I think, of mitigation and adaptation. The other piece is, you know, I'm working on more on video and hoping to do place uh, some of these more kind of place-based stories. I might embed with something called Grizzly Corps, which is kind of like the Sicilian Conservation Corps of California. Maybe do some solar-powered road trips. You know, take, take people places that they maybe haven't been. And I'm going to continue to explore some of the, the science and the evidence for you know, individual action and, and really what matters and why and how people can incorporate that into their own lives. Well, I appreciate the Washington Post giving you the con because it is very eclectic. You know, I don't read everything. I'd be like, maybe the aviation. Yeah, I don't recall reading that one, but it's like, it's just, it's a, a thought exercise that sometimes you wouldn't necessarily see in a major newspaper, which is kind of fun. So Great. I'm glad they let, let you do that. Glad you're reading it. Thank you. All right. Last question. And I ask all my guests this, if you could recommend one person to come on this podcast, which focuses on adaptation, but there could be another reporter, who would it be? I'm going to say Diane Wilson, who recently won the Goldman Environmental Prize. And what has fascinated me about her is that she was a shrimper, Louisiana, uh, I believe, and has almost single-handedly won a massive series of lawsuits against Formosa Plastics, which is polluting her along the Texas Gulf Coast in Texas, excuse me. And her ability to rally a community and to, to get consequential action at the state and the local and the national level really blew me away. And, you know, I think to get the type of change we need, you will probably need to see many more people like her take on a lot of vested interests and and how she did that is fascinating to me and I'm something I hope to explore in the future. So I would be interested to hear from her. All right. Great recommendation. All right, Michael, this has been a pleasure. My first Washington Post reporter. You guys are doing great work there and thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay, Adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks to Michael Korn for coming on the podcast. As I've said many times, I love talking to reporters and talking climate coverage. I learn a ton, and it is incredibly useful to me when I interview other climate experts. It's fantastic that news outfits like The Post, New York Times, and the LA Times have ramped up their climate teams. We've seen this before, but I finally think this critical coverage is here to stay. As I said to Michael, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall as they brainstorm how they might cover this issue. I still don't think many in the media get adaptation, though. It's lumped under impacts or not acknowledged as an emerging professional sector. I think when that happens, the public will truly understand that adaptation is here to stay and what it means in the larger climate change conversation. That said, every year the coverage keeps getting better. And I think climate skepticism should be a much bigger story. It's not okay when one of the major political parties thinks that it's a hoax and that has real world consequences. Think of pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords. And I think a lot of the survey work from Yale Six Americas is just wishful thinking. Americans still don't understand this issue and identifying those who are concerned about or those who are really concerned about climate change isn't going to move the needle forward. All right. Thanks again to Michael. Definitely check out his Climate Coach column. It's a great picker upper and the topics are fascinating. And thanks to Laura for coming on and telling us about the new season of Today I Learned Climate. Check it out in my show notes. As many of you may not be familiar with the behind-the-scenes efforts required to produce and sustain America Adapts, I'm making a pitch for your financial support. America Adapts is a small nonprofit organization centered around the podcast, and while I do receive sponsorship for specific episodes, I also rely on individual donations. Thanks to recent donors, Holly Niebuhr, Monica Serrano, Nicholas Agarani, Kyle Johnson, Sean Martin, Alec Applebaum, Jessica Meterson, Andrew Rumbach, Jeffrey Matthews, Michael Katzen of the Serendipity Foundation, Craig Morris, Don Wright, and Miles Yule. Thank you, guys. You're amazing, and I greatly appreciate your support. These donations are tax deductible since we are designated as a 501c3. Okay, people have shared how they've binged on episodes to grasp the essentials of climate adaptation. So in addition to the professional value you receive, please consider donating to help raise awareness about adaptation. We are all passionate about this issue, and I created the podcast precisely because I wanted to communicate the importance of adaptation. Podcast reaches influential individuals worldwide, and by supporting it, you, you become part of that valuable contribution. If we can spend money on $5 lattes without hesitation, please think about making a recurring donation of a similar amount to support America Apps. I rely on episode sponsorships and support from individual donors. 
For sponsored episodes for organizations and companies doing great adaptation work out there, consider sponsoring a whole episode. This opportunity allows you to showcase your organization's achievements to a wide network of climate professionals. By integrating a podcast episode into your long-term communication strategy, you can move beyond traditional formats like webinars and white papers to engage your audience effectively. Partner with us to identify experts who can share your organization's impactful adaptation work through the power of podcast storytelling. Podcasts offer an enduring value as they continue to promote your message long after the initial release, making them a valuable educational resource for years to come. Join our esteemed list of partners, which includes prestigious organizations like Battelle, NRDC, University of Pennsylvania at Wharton, World Wildlife Fund, UCLA, Harvard University, the Trustees of Reservations, and many more, so you can make a significant impact in the field of climate adaptation. For more information on how podcasts can benefit your organization or company, email me at americadapts at gmail.com. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.